directly into our apps. Uh, and that's how I basically everything started with Nodo. We uh, deployed with a few app developers. We launched the first app on the HTC phone, the first blockchain phone, the Exodus. Uh, so that was the first version of the Nodo Cash app. And we saw that basically a lot of traction and we quickly uh, reached, uh, like we probably all know the numbers already, but more than 5 million daily active nodes on this network. So the cryptocurrency was really the way to, to arrive uh, to build this economy. We believe it's just the beginning. Today we apply this to Bluetooth uh, because more than 50% of all IoT devices use Bluetooth. But we already have in the weeds work, uh, working uh, with a provider of 4G or 5G uh, solutions. And we believe that this will be applied soon to actually provide also access to LT uh, cellular. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting. If you look at all radio protocols, they're quickly becoming software defined. Um, and so we look at how do you build a platform that makes it really easy to deploy these, these protocols. Um, and maybe the protocol doesn't even matter. Maybe it's just an app, quite literally, running on the radio. Um, and so how do you take a wireless network, build apps into it, build search into it? So it's a totally radical perspective on how you think about wireless networks and how do you incentivize their deployment. Um, so Misha, maybe we want to go over the, um, the past week, just so we're clear with everyone, and then do some questions. Absolutely. So last week has a, a few, uh, I mean, a, a large number of lucky people. So actually close to 19,000. Uh, you saw that basically you all received, uh, if you are part of these people, more rewards that you probably expected. Uh, what happened is uh, we had a backlog in the way these rewards were distributed. So we uh, launched a process to be able to uh, uh, apply the rewards uh, that we are missing uh, to most of the people and accelerate the, the reward process. But while uh, we uh, launched that backlog process to, to distribute these rewards, uh, what's happening, there was basically uh, a bug which uh, was linked to modifications we made in the way the rewards are distributed. And that caused uh, 19,000 people, for a bit less, 18,000, I think, uh, 856 people uh, to receive uh, more rewards than uh, than they should have normally received. Uh, we, uh, we we don't think basically it's affecting anything in the in the cryptonomics because and uh, it's uh, just basically three days of rewards, uh, and uh, so the impact is minimal. I would say on the all my, the mining and the tokens that are allocated for for my and need to be mined and, and minted. Uh, it created excitement among the people who received it. So. I mean, we, we think it's a, that, that, that's a good thing, uh, but we also take it very seriously because we don't want this kind of things to, to happen again. And if we decide to reward the community with additional uh, tokens or bonuses or for taking an action collectively, which will be introduced soon with, uh, with missions, then we want to basically uh, be on top of it and, and decide and basically uh, and, and, and know why we are making these rewards and accelerating these rewards. So, uh, that's a little bit about it. Maybe Garrett, you want to add something? Sure. Um, so, uh, so yeah, and we really just try to do our best to be transparent uh, with any issues that we have. Um, Nodal is uh, is still pretty young, even though we've been at it for several years. So, we're constantly scaling and constantly uh, building out our team uh, to make sure that these issues don't happen again and that we can have a very robust, resilient, and decentralized system ahead. So that's part of the reason we wanted to do this AMA, just to make it clear, but also give you guys a question, the opportunity to, uh, to ask questions. Um, Darren, I'm thinking if we have people ask their questions verbally or if we just have them type it in the little chat. I think we can start with some pre-submitted questions. Um, there's one I'm gonna submit in here. Hopefully I can tag the right person. It's uh, J10 Bigfield. Um, I don't know if this will work, um, but yeah. Yeah, it is, it is, it is our first um, audio AMA, guys. Uh, we are super excited. Uh, it's actually great to have you uh, live and to be able to answer your questions Thank live. Thank you so much. Uh, but we, but we, have so, we have to do some fine tuning because it's the first time we use that tool in, on Telegram. So here we go. The first question, um, what are your competitive advantage, advantages over similar IoT blockchain projects like Helium and so on? 
Well, um, I can take that. Go ahead, Misha. I, I can I, I I I can start, and maybe you 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 can you 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 can um add, add more things. Yep. I just want to um say a few things that uh, so first I, we when we started we were using a, basically a blockchain. We are more like a layer two application uh, because we are using Stellar. We quickly saturated the Stellar network by realizing 1.4 million microtransactions a day. And we, that was more than 40% of the whole Stellar network at that time. And uh, we had in mind to actually go onto our own chain from the beginning, but we wanted to do it at the right timing with the right technology. We found a great uh, opportunity uh, with Polkadot and Substrate and decided to move Polkadot Substrate. We actually love the environment. We love the, the way the administration uh, uh, is in place and the interface to actually manage uh, uh, the chain and the evolution of the chain. Um, and uh, so that was basically a great move that we decided and uh, yeah, and we think we did very well. Uh, we did very well to, to, to do that. So we think first that being on Substrate and Polkadot is a big competitive advantage uh, because we really believe in that ecosystem. We really believe in the interoperability of that ecosystem and we believe that all the chain, thanks to that operator, interoperability will be able to use the services produced on the nodal ecosystem and the, and the nodal chain. Um, the second thing I want to highlight is the experience of the team in the space of uh, wireless uh, and communications. We are a very experienced team. We are not here to do a one shot. We've been working at this for uh, four years just with nodal, but it's a project that basically Garrett and I have been uh, excited about. And it's a dream that we have for, I would say, uh, concern meaning me, Garrett is younger than me, but it's, it's tens of years, something I really wanted to realize uh, when uh, I was a teenager. So it's something that we are here for the long term. Uh, we really want to arrive to the point where we will bring connectivity for free to people. Um, and we think we have the formula for that. And uh, that's also thanks to you and the whole community. And uh, because without you and without the community, we wouldn't be able to achieve that. I will let Garrett go into the specifics about the competitive advantages, but I think we have many. Uh, and uh, yeah, Garrett. Yeah, um, I think there's a lot of interesting things. I mean, the, this, the first thing is we've just gone all down all the rabbit holes. <laughs> we have made all of the mistakes uh, when deploying wireless networks. Um, but uh, we've really seen that if you have to go and deploy physical infrastructure, that's a big disadvantage. Nodal is a software only network. So we can deploy a massive wireless network just with software. So as quickly as you can install an app, you can cover an entire country or continent with connectivity. And that's never been possible before where you would have to deploy this, this infrastructure. And the most common infrastructure, wireless infrastructure around the world is the smartphone that's right in your pocket. So we think that's our primary advantage is that we are a software only network. We can deploy much more quickly than, than other types of networks. And with that architecture in mind, we can have Bluetooth is just an app. We can have other wireless protocols like Wi-Fi or LTE that's supported on the phone as an app. So if the hardware can support it, our network can support it as well. So those are, those are really our primary advantages. If we dig into the weeds a little bit, um, and I'll only focus for a second on this, is if you look at the amount of energy, uh, megabits per milliwatt seconds, that's required to move a bit of data from a device up to a cloud. Uh, the nodal is the most efficient network in the world from the movement of data in terms of energy, in terms of, of low cost. So we think that's massively uh, important and interesting. So we have another question. Um, I'd like to hear the team, this is from TBC underscore Andrew. I'd like to hear the team talk about data product offerings. What kind of data is available to buyers, data privacy, and use cases for these data buyers? Uh, Misha, I can take this one if you like. Um, yes, go ahead. Uh, I think we have a yeah. few examples, and and maybe you, you can mention the work we already have done with uh, a few big players of the industry in the U.S. when it comes to location tracking and uh, the industrial use case for location tracking sure. of assets. We basically do what Apple or uh, does, but uh, with the Apple tag, but uh, at an industrial level. And yeah, uh, we'll touch on, the, on on basically the work we are doing with big rapid career uh, companies. Yeah. Um, yeah. So 
the big the big difference and, and this is core to our company's belief is that big tech companies believe they should have monopoly on your privacy so if you're driving through most city in america these days there's these huge billboards that say x brand we care about your privacy um they do but they don't actually give you control they take all your data they keep it very safe in big server um, usually these servers are right across the street from the big government data centers um, and we think there's a better way we think that if we're going to connect a trillion things to the internet this has to be secure and i'm not talking i keep all your data safe my little bucket secure i'm saying real cryptographic distributed hardware security. That's the only way that we can ensure a world of a trillion things is a world that we want to live in. That a world of a trillion things isn't being hacked by nation states or being backdoored by other governments um, because this can get really messy really fast. So what we do is we believe that users should be in control of their privacy. We even want to push that to the IoT device. I'll say that IoT devices should have control over their own privacy. So the first uh, thing that we do is we protect users. So we don't associate their their identifiers with uh, personal information like their phone number or their, their IMEI, like their phone. We just use the public key. And we're actually working on ways to basically abstract that public key. So even the data that's hitting our servers is really hard to track back to an individual user. On top of that, um, if people want to purchase data from our network, they're only allowed to, to purchase data from devices that they own. And they have to prove that they own these devices. So we're not gonna sell a competitor information about another company's device. Uh, that, that's just wrong. You have to own your device and we're migrating to a space where you have to actually be able to cryptographically prove. So we're deploying cryptographic implementations on the IoT device that require you to, uh, to prove that you're the owner of this device. And that's part of the proof of connectivity. So we respect user privacy. We wanna be encrypting IoT traffic at the edge. Um, and so that's really core to our, our beliefs. Um, now we're also experimenting with what can be done with these massive data sets. So what if you can allow a, a logistics provider to connect their data to a, a pallet tracking company and connect that to uh, maybe an e-commerce company? We think that these, network effects between data sources will actually build um, more value than potentially any other company has generated. You know, Google today is just in the digital world. Nodal is a wireless network, but it's also essentially a search engine into the physical world. And we're still grasping with what that means or what, what, what could be capable with that. But we're also trying to take a very slow methodical approach and say, how do we build something that can be extremely valuable but also do it while protecting user privacy. Because in the end, we have to make sure this is a world we wanna live in. Um, in terms of people that we're actually working with, so we're in, in deep discussions with shipping pallet companies, um, people that basically wanna connect shipping pallets, but they can't because it's too expensive to use a, a SIM card. And Bluetooth is really that perfect, uh, that perfect price point. Um, we're doing things like uh, tracking of stolen vehicles. So you can basically cover a car with Bluetooth tags and if that gets stolen or even parts get, get taken off that car, uh, it'll show up on our network. We can find that. Um, so those are kind of some of the use cases uh, that we're focusing on right now. Misha, I don't know if you had any other ones that you wanted to add, um, but just really in the asset tracking space, how we can secure, protect user privacy, and then enable all kinds of interesting use cases. Go ahead, Misha. Um, well, I, I, I think uh, maybe one important thing that is, we can mention is uh, uh, the way we, we, were, we want and we think the industry is going. Because we believe that uh, every item, every device basically is going to have um, microprocessor and a, and a wireless communication interface with them because the cost of these things is going yeah. down and uh, we, uh, we think that what's missing is, uh, is actually the, the simple connectivity layer and architecture to enable all these things at some point to communicate and be able to exchange data. Uh, and, uh, and that's what we are really building with Nodal. We are building this uh, architecture, which is fully decentralized, that uh, is going to fully protect people's privacy and the privacy of the data of these devices. 
and uh, and and we want to do that in a very simple manner like today if you if you are um, a manufacturer and you want to join the network you don't need to modify your firmware you just need to comply with the bluetooth standard and then you can start to use the network to send and receive data and that's uh, a big 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 change and a big improvement um, compared to the traditional world of the telecommunication industry and uh, we want that to work for not only bluetooth but wi-fi uh, lte 4g 5g and and that's the way we are building this network and uh, we, we think that's going to make a, a big big difference basically yeah and and just to misha's point there the you know if you're in san francisco you see self-driving cars driving around essentially the entire world is being mapped in 3d in real time uh if you look at the cost of sensors uh, a bluetooth chip today the, the unit cost if i'm ordering millions is around 40 cents so that means that i can build an embedded bluetooth tag with computing it runs you know its own operating system it has memory it has sensors for less than a dollar and that cost is going to decrease essentially ex almost exponentially uh, forever and so in a few years we're going to see the entire world not only be digitized but be digitized with sensors and have compute functionality being built into it you know we think of us interacting with computers the computers will become reality we're just going to be walking through this giant networked computer world um, and if nodal doesn't succeed uh, we're going to see the big tech companies of the world build this stuff and that might not be a world you want to live in so we're very very confident that uh, if there's going to be a trillion things it has to be decentralized has to be secure and we have to have these these privacy protocols built in natively to it um, if you look at the just the laws in in california there's no right, there's zero regulation on, on what can be collected by an autonomous vehicle. So every time these things go by, they're mapping license plates, they're mapping faces. Uh, there's basically no regulation because it's public space. Um, and so imagine that times a trillion. Uh, what does that mean for the world? So we think that privacy and decentralization are, are gonna, be, uh, gonna be essential. Um, let's take the next question, if that's okay, Michelle. So, um, or maybe we uh, let. Why, why don't we take some? Uh, why don't we take some hands up? Take some yeah. questions from the audience. So, Benny, I'm I'm uh, on you to speak, Benny. Oh, hi! Can you hear me? Yeah, hi, Benny. Yeah. How are you? Oh, I, I'm good. I'm good. Thank you. Uh, I just got a generic question regarding the sort of the app, um, like you know, uh. I, I downloaded the app quite about two, three months ago and on my iPhone and sort of the, like I've been trying to actively uh, sort of make sure that it's, it's always working uh, up and running, but I don't, like, you know, I, I believe there's some sort of issue with uh, iOS. Um, could you just run down as to what is the difference between uh, sort of the yeah. Android and, uh, and so on? Thank you. Well, yeah, so, I can take that. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. I think I will, I will, I will, I will take this question. So, um, iOS is a little bit more difficult because they, they, they actually are much more aggressive than Android when it comes to killing a process that's run in the background. We have overcome that a lot by uh, actually uh, activating location services uh, and maintaining them through different techniques because we have a long expertise in on an iOS on that space uh, for maintaining actually the process the longest possible. We still think we can make improvements. Um, and uh, so I think the app is gonna improve uh, actually a, lo a lot in the coming six months when it comes to maintaining this process in the background. Also because as the network grows and as the density of the network improves in certain location, uh, then this will also help maintain these processes in the background. Uh, so you don't need to have always your uh, your phone uh, with the screen on. So on iOS now, we recommend that, yes, you should go back to the app often. You should keep the screen on. That's the best way for you to keep on generating rewards and connecting things. Um, if you have uh, um, a MacBook uh, uh, with the M1 processor, you can also now run the app on your MacBook, uh, which is pretty cool uh it's not optimized for the for the m1 yet but uh it is working and 
obviously on the Mac you can maintain the process also on more easily um, than on a smartphone. Um, the Android uh, has always been easier to uh, to deal with uh, the Bluetooth interface and to maintain processes in the background. Uh, the new uh, updates on Android sometimes uh, try to shut down this process, so we recommend users to actually go into the settings in the battery to go into the specific uh, application or the cache and ask for uh, removing the optimization of the of the battery for the app, uh, and that will improve basically the processes and help the app generate more more rewards. Garrett, you want to add? And we're also discuss yeah, and we're also working with um, smartphone manufacturers as well to really optimize the process at the OS layer. Um, they love the idea of providing value after they sell the phone, just because most Android phones, they don't, I think the profit margin is literally in the tens of dollars if they're lucky. Um, so they're also looking for ways to reward the users and increase their, their benefit after they're sold. So um, also if people wanna just chat questions, they can do that um, as well. Um, we had a few people with their hands up. I know Rick, I saw you for a while. Do you wanna ask your question? And then we can take Jay. Go ahead, Rick. Otherwise, we'll take uh, Jay. Uh, uh, Rick, ahead, one Jay. second. One second, Rick. I'm trying to. Oh. Yeah, here we go. So you should be able to speak, Rick. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Hey, Rick. Yeah. Wonderful. Welcome. Thank you, guys. Welcome. Uh, I'm, I'm, I, was, I heard you guys speak on the technology, and I think it's awesome. I want to, you to comment on the economics and tokenomics of the project. Uh, what are you sure. guys doing sure. in terms of, uh, um, like, what is your focus in terms of client base and who is your target clients? Sure. And is, uh, are they, are the potential customers, do they purchase Noto Cash in order to use the service? Or like maybe you can get into explaining how the tokenomics of it all works. Absolutely. Sure. So there, um, there are and, um, many aspects there uh, in, 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 in your question. So, uh, so and I, I want to take advantage of answering your question by answering also someone else's question, which was uh, Terence, I think, Makina asking about how we intend to cover enough have enough coverage to be able to provide a good service so uh, the the network and the ecosystem is built like a multi-sided marketplace on one side you have the supply and these are people like you who are installing the nodal cache and generating another cache by connecting to devices and creating coverage with their smartphone uh, there are people like app developers who uh, embed the, the networking library and basically build that coverage and presence on smartphones at another scale because they have access very often to millions of smartphones through their app. Um, and uh, so that's basically the supply side. Uh, we think we can achieve uh, a reasonable coverage pretty quickly because we actually made tests in the past uh, and we were able to get fantastic results. I mean, we made tests because we had uh, potential customers which are big names among the big five uh, companies that you all know uh, that were asking us to help them actually to do a better job to be able to locate their devices when it comes to services like the find by and uh, so we were able to see that in some cities uh, we actually achieve a pretty good density already uh, we had uh, this for example uh, working in japan in tokyo where we were taking a specific uh, area uh, and we were able to tell how many times per hour we were having someone with a node passing by to be able to collect data from that specific area. So I don't think uh, we will have issues to reach a, a reasonable coverage globally uh, if we can keep on uh, basically growing the community like we do and develop more partnership with people like app developers or manufacturers of smartphones who are going to embed hot technology or even mobile operators who are going to use hot technology to, uh, to provide uh, basically some of the services that uh, can be built on the network. So that's the supply side. On the demand side, you uh, have enterprises um, that want to use the services and access the network. The first services that we built, uh, we built them ourselves. So the 
smart asset API to locate things or collect data from sensors, we build it ourselves. And we have a lot of companies that use it already, that used it in the past and will use it in the future for locating items. And they are pretty big players. People like uh, people who build shipping pallets and the number of units in the shipping pallet industry is in billions of units a year. People like rapid couriers who ship every day millions of packages of mail who want to use the network. Um, and uh, and uh, so the and these are just using some of the applications we build ourselves. What we want is the community of app developers to develop applications directly on our network in our ecosystem and be the one be paid by the community. Uh, I mean, by, by by the people who purchase the service to to build these services. And uh, when we come to that, uh, there are different kind of services we can add to. And we have defined in the white paper just only 20, but we actually think it's hundreds of applications that can be built on the network. And maybe I will let Garrett mention a few of them uh, to, to provide more details on what we just said. But we, we think that actually the the app developers at some point will be the, with the new applications that can run on the network will be the one driving more and more demand for the network. And to come back to your point, yeah. yes, people to access these services, they need to pay in another cash. They need to use another cash. Um, yeah, so Garrett, if you want to go maybe with the, some examples of customers. Yeah, and and so uh, we, we can dive into that. I think people have a lot of other questions too. Um, we we have built essentially a platform Good afternoon. with can APIs. You hear me? One one second. I just wanted to say one thing is um, is basically we've built a platform with services, and then we built managed services on top. So the asset tracking API. Uh, we did some things around COVID. Um, we build these services and then demo them with customers to really show demand. Our long-term goal is to actually build out a, a, uh, a platform where people can build new things because we keep finding really interesting um, things that people want to do with this network that we've never imagined. And that's why we're just focusing on how to scale this network, how to really build out the platform. Um, so we had one, one more question. Rick, I'm just going to mute you if that's okay. Can I interject one quick one before you do that? Sure, go ahead. Yeah, so um, my 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 question basically, uh, in addition to like when currently when all the phones are currently mining, is there is a subsidy involved in in the mining process right now, and how is the paid service kind of uh, meld together? Sure, you... uh, Misha, did you want to take that one or? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear everything. I, I have a go ahead. Sure, I'll, I'll yeah. take it, and I'm I'm just going to mute you, mute you, Rick. So, sure. um, so um, right now it comes from essentially an unmined pool. So at the beginning, Nodal it was very easy to mine, so we mined a bunch of coins, um, and now there's still a large pool of of tokens of coins that are unmined, and so the the people that are are mining coins are coming from this unmined pool. Um, in terms of when people are building services on top of the network, that will um, basically, a, you can think of like a revenue share will go out to these users um, from actual services running on the network. But most of the network today is built just from um, this unmined pool. So hopefully that answers your question. And we'll we'll do our best to answer most of the tokenomic questions. I know our legal team is <laughs> doesn't want us to basically answer anything, but we'll do our best to explain this. And we're also working on some materials to go more in depth to the theory behind uh, what we're doing. Um, I'll take uh, Jay. I know you had some uh, some questions. I'm going to unmute you. And I also think I saw you on the uh, the Telegram uh, group. Or sorry, the uh, the Discord as well. So I know you had some good questions. Go ahead, Jay. Hey guys, um, yeah, sorry for uh, pinging you guys so much. This is um, I've been diving into the project the last couple of days, and I uh, yep, I tend to get involved on the economic sides of crypto projects. But um, and uh, I can ping some of you guys after for some of the more complex stuff here. But uh, a yep. couple sort of tied together questions is when should we expect seeing more transparency around the Oracle calculations? Because yes. like that is largely going to drive how people optimize yep. you know the network and right now it um you know it's like we all know that data isn't handled 
the same, like paid data is higher, unpaid data is lower, um, but just the dramatic sort of um, uh, range that we're seeing in uh, the value of packets and things like that, uh, there's a lot of opaqueness there um, that I would love to sort of dig in as a community into what that calculation looks like and how to incentivize, um, you know, the, the there's like the paid data, uh, which, you know, in my opinion, it should sort of be one bucket that you get paid out yeah. for. Then there's sort of the data or the, the rewards to incentivize growth of the network, um, which shouldn't really tie to whether or not it's paid. Um, so, Jay, Jay that's yeah. a very good question. Um, and uh, I mean, the goal is to basically let an oracle uh, basically be fully and be fully transparent so you can actually check the formula and, and, and verify all these things. Um, I think we are going by steps. Our goal is really to get to the point where basically there's full transparency on everything that's happening. Um, it's going to take a bit of time though. Uh, I mean, some of the, the issues that we had actually uh, last week were coming from the fact that we had to upgrade the way we calculate these rewards. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of complexity because it's millions of uh, elements and items that need to be considered at the same time. Um, so what you're going to start seeing is uh, we're going to announce partnership with specific providers of appliances or sensors. And uh, uh, we will notify the community that if they actually use these appliance or sensors or they are in proximity of them, basically the level of the reward will be higher than uh, for other traditional uh, sensors. Uh, so that's going to be a way to be also more transparent and to also give the community ways to uh, increase the reward by maybe uh, buying an air quality sensor from a specific provider or buying uh, just a temperature sensor from a, from a specific provider we are partnering with. Um, and uh, I think that's going to be the best way for the community also to understand what's happening better um, and uh, to appreciate the, the reward formula. What is sure is uh, it's a very complex uh, thing that we are building and uh, we will have over time to change the reward formula and to update it very often. Uh, so, um, yeah, it's, it's a process that's going to take time before it arrives to uh, something that basically can be uh, working fully uh, autonomously. Uh, but that's our goal. We really want the system to become fully autonomous at some point and be fully decentralized and, and, and basically uh, we want to let the, the, the network be, be run by uh, the people who will be participating in building the infrastructure, so the, the validator nodes, which are also a big part of the, of the token economics. Yeah, but like, do you expect then at some point in the near future to get to that point where the Oracle, like the way it's set up right now in the centralized manner, it's, it's sort of all on you guys versus allowing the community to sort of say, okay, this is where you guys are going to run into gaming opportunities, arbitrages, like, you know, in my opinion, having 10 or 15 people's eyes in that is a lot more helpful than having two, is that, or whatever, the number five, um, is that, do you guys, like, are, should we expect to totally, see a totally, transparent to, oracle sometimes? To, 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 uh, so totally agree, Jay. I think uh, we want to get there. Uh, but before we want to get there, we want to start to accept validator nodes, basically to start really decentralizing the, the, the infrastructure to another level. And after that, uh, yes, the next step will be to provide more transparency on the formula and also to have the community participate uh, and uh, have the community vote also sometimes on basically the directions we are taking in, in how the formula is going to evolve. So 100% agree in agreement with you on this uh we hope we can get there yesterday i would say <laughs> but uh it's uh it, it, it takes time and to That's come good. back to your point it's a uh, it's a uh, today it's maybe a handful of people who are basically deciding on these things um uh, but it's uh it's probably the right thing to do at the stage where we are uh but where we want to get yes is to a point where not only just the community but the people who are actually purchasing the services on the network will be participating on that. And so uh, the same way you have on the app, I don't know if you were early on the app, but we had at some point missions being introduced uh, uh, last year. Uh, we're going to bring back these missions where basically users can be rewarded more for taking certain action or certain paths. And uh, that's going to influence also the reward. So but from a high level, I'm interested in hearing your guys' opinion on like how much value do you guys put on um 
call it proof of coverage, which is what some other networks call it, um, but um, providing incentivizing non-paid uh, rewards that are not connected to paid data because they have two very different value adds and it's sort of a chicken and the egg where if you want you know massive data coverage that companies are going to get into um leaving a whole bunch of people that are earning nothing while there's no paid nodes around them you know is is going to sort of limit your ability to build that um yeah so that's network so that's what we want to decide so is that exactly what the point i was touching on when it comes to missions uh yes and it's already in the formula like uh, when we implement more of the elements that are in the white paper you will see that uh, yeah you have more value as a node if you are alone in a location than if you have 10 people around you like if you take a bus and you have 15 users of single cash in the bus then these 15 users have less value than if you are uh, just one in that bus to be able to collect the data so um, yes this is going to be taken into account and with the missions uh, there are going to be rewards that, uh, and, and payments that are going to be related directly to the formula, but will be related to achieve certain things. And among these things, it can be going to a specific location. And I think you're going to start to, to see that and people will understand with the next update of the app where uh, you're going to see this kind of thing basically being introduced in the user experience. It's going to be very cool. Yeah. And, and are there rewards Jay, let's, today? Let's continue. Yeah, I don't want to uh, take up all the time here. Let, so let's yeah, continue in the Telegram. I'm, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to... Uh, yeah. I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna mute you back, but I think any anyone that can poke holes in our tokenomics, like we encourage you guys to really like do these things um, because it's just gonna improve the community as a whole. Our 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 main kind of theory behind this is that demand for wireless networks generally doubles every uh, twelve to twenty months. I think it's actually accelerating, um, but it's based on something called Edholm's law and something called. Uh, Marty Cooper's law, which generally is the idea that our ability to send data in a given wireless spectrum is increasing, and people take advantage of that, and they want to fill it up by watching Netflix and 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 sending data and machines talking to each other. And we actually think that, uh, and there's some data to show that the demand for IoT is actually accelerating much more quickly than humans. And so, by building a network that's focused on IoT, we can actually capture that demand and then use that demand to directly incentivize uh, growth. And so we think that we can, we can have some, some really interesting growth uh, potentials by directly incentivizing the supply. Um, but we also think that that also means that some of the traditional tokenomic theories that apply to other networks might not apply to wireless networks. So um, Dominic, I know you've had your hand raised for a while, so I'm gonna unmute you and let you ask your question. Go ahead. Are you able to speak, Dominic? It looks like you have to unmute. I'll give you five more seconds and then we'll, um, Hans, I know that you wanted to speak as well. So I'm just gonna mute Dominic again. And uh, Hans, I'm gonna unmute you. Go ahead, Hans. Hans, uh, can you speak? All right, well, I'm gonna go ask, take some questions from the community Darren or Misha, did you have any good ones that you wanted to uh, uh, to to mention? I know we have some some pretty cool ones. Yeah, there's um, <clears throat> a lot of people have questions around missions, and I'm so excited to relaunch. But uh, when when missions? When missions? Uh, maybe we keep that one a little secret for now. Uh, I had some cool calls with some companies that actually want to use that to try to get people into remote areas. Um, let's uh let's release the new app and then we can we can talk a bit more about that um do we have uh, uh any information on a new app yes well we the we can app? we can say we can yeah. say that basically the the ui is pretty advanced um uh, and uh and uh yeah so we are we, we are getting close uh, I, I i think we will um maybe uh, share a few uh, a few screens of the new app uh, in the community before it gets released uh, to tease everyone and to, uh, to show that we are progressing but uh, yeah the new app would be introducing uh, uh, missions actually for, for the first new users who will come in basically they will be asked to do something um, and be rewarded for it yeah 
Another question was, um, in the future, can we expect a nodal kind of dedicated device like Helium or something like that? Um, the honest answer is I would love to build something like that. Um, the also honest answer is that building hardware kills. Uh, we built our own custom hardware for contact tracing during COVID. Um, and actually trying to build hardware in America is just a big old mess. Um, we're actually probably 20 or 30 years behind Asia in that regards. Um, so yes, it's something we'd love to do. It doesn't make any economic sense right now. And we think that we want to get really good at, at supporting things like phones and Teslas and all kinds of other existing hardware, because that's really our way that we can scale before um, building a dedicated device. Yeah, we, we um, will actually on that topic announce a, a partnership with a, a manufacturer of uh, cellular uh, uh, base stations pretty soon. Uh, so yes, our, our strategy is more to partner with manufacturers who build these base stations and enable our app to run on their uh, on their hardware. Uh, actually, for even people who are already doing this with Helium, there will be also an app for us, probably for Raspberry Pi, so that we'll be able to run on these boxes as well. Yeah, cell towers have a lot of computing power, and for most of the day, they're not being used. Um, so that there's there's something cool there. Hans, uh, I know you raise your hand again, so I'll give you a few seconds to speak. Uh, Hans, do you were you able to, uh, to ask your question? Uh, good evening, everybody. Can can you hear me? Clearly? Hey, yeah, we hear you great. Thanks for coming. What's your question? I uh, I hope you can clear, hear me clearly. I'm gonna I'm gonna try to um, to ask my question. Uh, first sure. of all, to the to the founders of uh, Nodal, thank you very much for this AMA. Uh, I'm delighted to be a part of this, um, and at the same thank time, you. I'm very enthusiastic of uh, the future that uh, is upon us. Um, to just get to right down to my question, um, I'm a business developer by profession, so um, I work usually with technical companies and try to assist them into the roadmap development. Um, one of the curious things about Nodal is that I haven't seen a, a roadmap which is really toilet on the marketing aspect on the coming few years. Um, maybe I'm a bit ahead of uh, schedule, let's say, but uh, I'm curious how uh, the Nodal, Nodal team aims to uh, increase scalability of the, of the company. Um, and secondly, sure. uh, how uh, the company will try to at least uh, mitigate uh, customer adoption uh, also in the near future. Thank you very much. Sure. So, so much uh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, these are very good questions. Um, so I think we shared a, a roadmap uh, in a in a deck uh, which was showing the previous uh, achievements of the company and the future achievements uh, in a deck uh, that we rolled out when we actually uh, uh, performed. Uh, the first uh, token sale. Uh, we uh, we have a, a roadmap that uh, is up to date. Uh, what happened is that recently we uh, reorganized the way we are working with the company. We went from 12 people in the month of uh, February, March, to uh, now more than 30 people in the company. We plan to be almost 45 in the coming two months. Uh, so that has been basically uh, taking a lot of our time uh, to be able to scale the team and reorganize the way we work. It's not the same when you are 10 people than when you are almost 50, 50 people to work together. So that created a bit of inertia, but I think once uh, this is going to be uh, flowing uh, better and we become, uh, we're going to become more and more efficient and we also will be able to update more often uh, the goals. The way it is organized in the company is we have uh, different teams you have uh, different teams for different aspects of the technology, one responsible for the services uh, and the network. Uh, you have a, a team responsible for the mobile application um, and uh, uh, you have a team responsible for the blockchain architecture uh, and infrastructure. So uh, each of these teams uh, have specific goals for each quarter. Uh, they have uh, intermediary goals each month for each month. And, uh, and that's basically how we are re reorganizing the whole company. So um, once uh, this is going to be uh, flowing a bit uh, a bit better, now we are really implementing all this. 
Uh, we started the first quarter working that way, uh, actually, uh, at the beginning of, uh, of, uh, of July. So it's very recent. Uh, I think you're going to see more updates uh, on the roadmap. And, um, and, and yes, we will also, we, when we redo the website, which is uh, planned to, that to happen in the coming weeks, you, you will see also uh, more transparency on what is to come and be uh, deployed on the network. Um, so I hope that answers, uh, answers your question. So we have another question from Mandude. Uh, would aggregators have access to purchase this data? For example, could Axiom buy this data to enhance their data insights? So one thing that we're very clear about is we do not sell raw data. We've had lots of people offer. Um, <laughs> I'm sure you guys have heard of all the fun stories of shady data resellers. Um, it's, it's really more crazy than the movies. Um, and so, no, we, we, we wouldn't provide raw data access. We are looking at how can we provide insights? So how can we actually search our, provide a search query on top of our network? Because a lot of Bluetooth devices, they follow a Bluetooth language, which is called GAT. And so a lot of devices, actually billions of devices, all broadcast um, their temperature, their battery level. Um, I can actually go into our network, we can search battery level, hit enter, and the battery level of millions of devices is returned back to us. Um, so this idea of how, what is a searchable wireless network? What does it mean? What, is, what can you do with that? I don't know yet. Um, so we're looking right now really at the privacy implications of this. Um, also the infrastructural challenges that querying you know, hundreds of gigabytes daily can mean. Um, and also you know, what, what can we learn um, and how can basically the owners of these IoT devices actually get rewarded by offering up some of these things. Um, so as Misha mentioned, we're going to start to explore some of these ideas with um, allowing people to buy devices, buy Bluetooth devices that actually collect data, um, and they get rewarded more for that data. Um, so you are an owner of an IoT device, it's generating maybe temperature or humidity, uh, and you get paid for that. So we're starting to experiment with some of these things um, right now, and we'll probably open that up once we've really solved some of those privacy challenges. Um, so Jaren, I don't know if you have any other good ones. I'm also going through the document to see if we have any stuff that stands out. Um, we have Aris A that wants to speak. Um, so I'm gonna unmute Aris. And Hans, if you have more questions, feel free to type them in the chat. We can answer them there. So Aris, uh, you are on the air. Hi guys, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, great. Hello. Uh, hi, uh, thanks for having this MA, it's been great. Uh, Thank you. I, I know that uh, you'll be joining the uh, parachain auctions on Polkadot Network in the coming months. And yes. I've seen, uh, I'm also been looking to other projects as well. And I know that there are some strong projects behind uh, joining the parachain auctions as well. Uh, yes. How confident, my question is, how confident are you that you'll be able to secure a parachain slot and uh, what are the consequences if a parachain slot is, cannot be secured? Thanks. Sure. So I, I thank can, you, Aras. I, 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 thank you, Aras. I can take this one, Garrett, uh, and maybe you Go can ahead. add more. Uh, so thank you for this question. We, um, like I mentioned earlier, and at the very beginning, we, we believe a lot in the Polkadot ecosystem and the interoperability of these uh, different blockchain and uh, ecosystems to work with one another. So one reason why we want to have a parachain is to be able to offer our IoT services or any services that app developers will develop in our ecosystem to actually other ecosystems running on other chains. Um, so that's one the, why the, the reason we want to have a parachain. We are not specifically looking at a parachain for securing the network because we believe we have enough traction with the validator nodes that we can secure our own network and eventually we could be even completely independent. Uh, and so, but there is an advantage and we, we actually uh, want to be, have a power chain to be able to offer our services to other ecosystems. Um, we are confident we will get a slot because we have uh, pretty strong partners uh, who we are working with already, like Republic, for example, uh, who now works also more closely with companies like uh, uh, Galaxy Digital. Uh, and they, they, are, they are working on the, basically uh, 
projects that will help basically projects like us be attract more people to be able to uh, to stake their uh, uh, dots and actually to help us uh, have a para, a para chain slot um, so we are building these partnerships uh, we also have uh, a reserve of dots ourselves that we're going to put to contribution for securing the parachain slots. Uh, what is important is we also don't want to uh, have this slot uh, basically um, reaching a crazy, crazy amounts. I think uh, it has to be reasonable. Uh, and to answer to your question, uh, yeah, if we don't secure a parachain slot, which I don't think because uh, we were one of the first two main nets on Polkadot. Uh, so I think it would be logical that we become uh, one of the top uh, ecosystem built on substrate Polkadot and that uh, we have a power chain. Um, uh, but in the event it was not ha it would not happen, then uh, I mean the network can secure itself. Uh, with, we have enough traction, we have enough people who want to participate in building validator nodes for that. Uh, so, and there are also other ways that are outside of power chain that now I start to be provided like bridges to basically reach different ecosystem, whether it's the Ethereum ecosystem or um, the uh, Polkadot ecosystem itself. So um, I, uh, I think for marketing reasons, for uh, confirming her, uh, her, her basically uh, her, um, her beliefs and uh, her uh, reinforcing her partnership with uh, the whole Polkadot ecosystem, I think it's important we get a parachain but uh, we could very well be completely independent and run that project completely independent. Yeah, I'd say that's a pretty good overview. I mean, and I, I've even told Polkadot, I said, guys, you know, we're not gonna spend $60 million on a slot that doesn't, whatever the price is these days. Um, I know some of the Kusama slots went for a lot of money. Um, you know, it's like the internet in the 90s. If, if to create a website on the internet in the 90s cost, $60 million, you, you wouldn't have the internet today. So um, I think it's a balance. Obviously, Polkadot provides a different value proposition than the internet does. Um, uh, but is it kind of worth what some of these prices were going on Kusama? Um, definitely debatable. But uh, also a lot of our early uh, investors, equity investors, are big uh, dot holders as well. So we're feeling very confident that we can get a slot. Um, and I think that it'll, it'll the Polkadot also, the, the, the company wants to make sure that it's uh, it, it makes sense for people and that it's it's incentivized. So we're very confident about that. Um, one question we got is: Can the app get congested in really busy environments? So where there's a lot of Bluetooth devices around? Um, yes. So a few things happen. The most common is that just the Bluetooth will crash. So Bluetooth is actually a dark art. Um, it's uh, it. it Nobody actually implements Bluetooth to the spec. Um, and so that means on Android, probably on iOS, um, there's bugs, there's issues, and they're in anywhere from the chip to the OS to the, the app. Um, and that means that sometimes Bluetooth will just crash. On Android, you see this, you saw it a lot on older versions of Android, like the past two or three versions, where you just have to restart the Bluetooth for it to work. The second thing that can happen is that you can actually saturate the wireless environment. You can just fill up the spectrum with noise so that um, some Bluetooth devices don't start to show up. Um, but you would then be, you would still be able to get some, some packets through. Um, so what you're seeing is when a device basically just goes to zero, that's actually probably the system just crashing. Like the modem is just failing and then it has to re reset itself. So um, Bluetooth is super buggy, even on production releases of the most modern operating systems. Um, so, and once you start to, uh, to, uh, to dive into that, you realize that, oh, uh, LTE and 5G are also really buggy <laughs> in their implementations on Android and iOS. Uh, and there's like a lot of things like CBRS that just don't work on modern smartphones. Um, so we had a few more questions, uh, uh, Jaren. Um, yeah, before we get to a couple last questions, um, some important announcements we are hiring if you guys have followed us on twitter um especially for a senior devops backend engineer uh, you can email your cv at people at nodal.co or apply to nodal.breezy.hr and we're offering referral rewards so it's 100 nodal per qualified candidate referral and 10,000 nodal 
for a successful hire. Their name, your name, must be mentioned in the application process if you're referring somebody to receive credit. And Garrett, something that you've been working on, sounds like a commercial, right? <laughs> so, Garrett, since something that you've been working on a lot is uh, app developer adoption <laughs> using our SDK. Do you want to yeah. talk about how you're onboarding? We just had a big announcement with ESTV. Maybe you can touch on that before we take our last questions. Uh, sure. Um, yeah, so we had, uh, we're working really on just closing app developers because the, the more big the network can be, uh, the more devices we can connect, the more value we can create. So we just partnered with ESTV uh, for their own app, but also their ecosystem. So if you guys are or know any app developers, we're also offering rewards uh, for that. So one of the big ways that we grow our network is through SDK partnerships. So we have a Nodal Cash app. We also have a Nodal SDK, which can basically be embedded into games and all kinds of things like that. So uh, that's how we actually plan on growing our network uh, significantly. Today, we're, we're, uh, we have a lot of nodes as an SDK, but actually the best data, the best nodes that we get are actually you guys. These are Nodal Cash app users. Um, so if you know anyone that has an app, uh, let us know. We'll, uh, we'll give you Nodal Cash. So I know Misha's got to jump. We can probably take one or two more questions. Before we before we go, um, man, dude, uh, you actually asked a really good question. I'm gonna allow you to speak, and you can ask your your other question. Go ahead. Hey, can you hear me all right? Yeah, we can hear. You. Yeah, I can hear you well. So I'm I'm gonna dig a little deeper on your your customers here, just to understand the the data the privacy behind it. So you know, I know you said you're not selling raw data, so you're not gonna sell the phone number or the you know, the device ID things like that. But, you know, what well, uh, just 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 to to be uh, clear, um, um, man, you, uh, on, on this, so you probably noticed, but uh, when you create an account on Little Cash, we don't ask you for an email, we don't ask for your phone number, basically we don't ask for your name. Uh, there, we we have no information about all these things, and uh, and we made it a point actually to uh, to be very minimal, just to be able to protect people's privacy the at the best. Uh, and uh, and that's very very important to us and core to what we are building. Yeah. And did you did you catch our answer to your question earlier about selling data? Yeah, that's kind of where where my question's headed. Is you know, are you guys looking yeah. at having subscribers and then they buy devices and that? Or are you looking at selling this like kind of bulk data, maybe be identified or some kind of segmented measures that they no. can send out? To people to Just buy IoT. We're really looking at IoT data. And I'd, I'd answered your question maybe 10 or 15 minutes ago. Um, basically, we're very privacy conscious. So if the only data that we provide today is you have an IoT device, um, you can prove to us that that's yours, and then that data goes to the cloud, basically. Any device, basically data that that device is transmitting um, can be routed on up to the cloud. Um, in terms of broad level analytics, we will never sell raw data. We believe it's just too dangerous. Uh, we've had lots of people try to buy it from us. Um, someday I'll write a book about it all. But no, we, we will not provide raw data. Um, in terms of insights, we're starting to look at, yeah, how, how can we use our network as a search engine for the physical world? So, um, and we're beginning with, okay, well, we have some partner devices. You can buy a temperature sensor or something like that. And then you get a bit of extra noble cash by collecting that data. So that's something that we are looking at we we hope to pilot in the next couple of months so does that okay, there is a, there is yeah, yeah that, that, that's what i want and, and there, there is one interesting aspect actually uh, uh man you that we, we we can highlight is uh, uh so we spend a lot of time on research and development uh, actually lucian who is doing that uh and spending most of his time or CTO on this uh came up with uh, an architecture that we're going to push at some point where Actually, the data never touches the cloud uh, servers and gets routed automatically uh, to the smart contracts and applications that basically use the data for providing a specific service uh, or get pushed to the basically the owner of the devices that uh, that uh, push the data. And uh, that will make it, uh, I mean, very, very uh, actually pri even more private and, uh, and, and will enhance the overall system. And we uh, we think it's uh, it's something that's going to be uh, necessary as we we grow and how the network basically grows. 
and that's a very uh, that is very very uh, very important. So the way it works, it's, uh, it's basically our nodes have the capacity to be a virtual machine and to host apps for app developers or businesses that want basically to connect or interact with their IoT devices. And that's one aspect we haven't advertised or talked a lot about. We are very, very proud of this uh, evolution in the architecture of the network because it will basically bring uh, the decentralization of the network to another level and, uh, and basically have all these apps that uh, today work uh, on servers in the cloud to be able to run directly at the edge of the network. Yep. Um, so uh, I guess a good last question before we wrap it up is, can you summarize the top five highlights of the last few months? Um, Misha, maybe you have some, some things that are on your mind? Well, a lot happened for us in the last, uh, I would say, in the last five months. Uh, we, we went from COVID. Uh, a company. <laughs> we survived COVID uh, last year. We went from a company of uh, 12 people, where when you are 12 people, it's more like run like a lab, to uh, a much bigger company where uh, now, like I said, we passed 30 people and we are going to on the pass to be over 40 in the coming uh, in the coming two months. So I would think that's uh, has been occupying a lot of our time to to be to scale up the team uh, we have uh, i think in terms of architecture also uh, uh, on the blockchain side we have achieved uh, we have achieved a lot and we are uh, ready to decentralize now the, the network and accepting uh, very little nodes it's a big step that's going to happen in the coming months uh, and we are super excited about that because it's really the beginning of a fully decentralized uh, um, iot network where we are not the only one who would be running these nodes. It will be people who are, have stake in the network, uh, who are partners in the network, and, and people who want to generate also revenues from participating in the validation of the data. So that's uh, and the transactions. So that's basically uh, uh, super important, and it's a very important uh, piece of uh, of work. So I would say it's the second big thing. Um, the, the the third uh, element I would I would mention. Uh, would be the, the number of partnerships uh, that we have put in place and are going to be announced in the coming weeks. Uh, I mean, you will see, we really have built partnership with pretty robust and big companies. Uh, I mean, in the past, uh, maybe you noticed, but we, we have a partnership with Cisco Meraki for some time. We have one with HTC. Uh, we are going to announce a big one with, uh, with Ledger, the, the hardware wallet uh, basically provider. Um, and uh, on the IoT side, uh, so, I mean, all these things, we're going to announce also a partnership that we mentioned before with uh, manufacturers of base stations. So all these things uh, have been taking time. Um, I think the mobile app also uh, is going to evolve in a pretty good direction when you, you will see when you have the new user experience. Uh, so we, we've been actually working on a lot of things in the last months and scaling the company. And I think you're going to see a lot of announcement and uh, excitement actually around the network for the, for the six months to come. Uh, and um, uh, and yeah, the big highlight also from the past five months, I would say, was the the first uh, sale of our token that happened. Uh, we basically waited four years, before, almost four years before to start to sell token. Uh, so that was a big, uh, a big, big step. All right. Well, I think with that, we can wrap up our nodal AMA. Feel free to ask questions in the uh, community on Telegram. Uh, we're most active there. I've also tried to be active on our Discord. If you have like really deep technical stuff, that's kind of what we like to keep the Discord for. So we'll be around uh, the whole day, and I'll do my best to, to check in on the chats uh, whenever I can. So thank you, everybody, for being part of the Nodal community. Uh, we just want to say that this network is built by you guys. So um, we really thank you for being part of it. Thank you yeah, so thank much. Thank you. Anything else? Oh, no, thank you everyone for joining, uh, and I hope we can uh, we can have uh, this kind of AMA more often with uh, with everyone. Yeah. All right. Bye bye everybody. Bye bye. Thank you everyone.